Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I'm Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. On today's show, we're going to recap the Fed meeting and discuss the chances of more interest rate hikes this year. And somebody just broke the world record for doing something in 3.13 seconds. I am not going to say what it is, but you can think about a few guesses before we reveal what happened later in the show. Then there's officially a new number one beer in America. We'll tell you who the new king is and who it dethroned in just a minute. And then we'll dive into the world of golf where the U.S. Open is kicking off today. You can bet that Neil and I will be watching, but so will U.S. Senators to see if there's any antitrust shenanigans going on. Neil, it's Thursday, June 15th. Let's ride. Okay, if Toby sounds a bit different in that intro, it's because for the first time in MBD history, Toby and I are doing this podcast without one of us in the studio. Uh, It is Toby this time. Uh, Toby, it's lonely here without you in New York City. Where are you? I am in the great Pacific Northwest. It's the first MBD slash PNW collab. I'm on my way to a bachelor party in Big Sky, but I uh, doing this podcast from Seattle, have a little layover. But I set my alarm for 1.45 a.m. this morning, which is just an ungodly hour to wake up to work. But if I had to do it with anyone, Neil, I'm glad I'm doing it with you. Oh, wow. I think I would have done <laughs> a – I think I just would have stayed up all night i don't know it's like i was thinking about it but yeah we're not we're not doing an all-nighter pod that would be a little too pushing it too far um so it's 307 a.m right now for you uh we're about to talk about the fed and if you have anything coherent to say (laughs) i will be very impressed (laughs) talking uh talking monetary policy uh in the (laughs) middle of the night so let's get to the fed um let's uh so that it did something yesterday that it hasn't done since march 2022 and that is not hike interest rates. After 10 straight rate increases, which were the most dramatic interest rate hikes since the 1980s, uh, Jerome Powell said it's time to take a breather to let those hikes filter through the economy and hopefully slow it down even more. This pause was expected, but everyone wanted to know the Fed's agenda for the remainder of the year. Well, most officials are penciling in two more rate hikes before 2023 is out, saying inflation and the economy have not slowed enough yet to say their job is done. Powell stressed that they're going to go off the numbers that come out in the next few weeks. So those two additional rate hikes are not written in stone at all. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, Neil, that even after kind of the most aggressive rate hike cycle in modern history that the Fed still hasn't really accomplished its goal of lowering uh, inflation. So you have consumer spending, which is still robust. The housing market is actually rebounded. Mm -hmm. Treasury yields are still below the inflation rate. And of course, the stock market is absolutely ripping still. We just entered a new bull market, 20% off the bear market lows. And so, yeah, it's kind of crazy that the more that people are betting on kind of this elusive soft landing where the Fed can lower inflation without sending the economy into a recession, the less likely it is to happen. So yeah, definitely still in a rock and a hard place because inflation is just stubbornly higher than that 2% number that right. the we, Fed wants. We just had the inflation report come out yesterday that said inflation had, had dropped uh, to less than half of its peak, but it's still 4%. Um, and and prices are rising uh, from food and in other areas. You talked about rental prices are growing uh, at a brisk pace. And, the inf- and they even upgraded their economic projections, the Fed did. Uh, the, originally, they said it would grow 0.4%. The economy would grow 0.4% in 2023. Yesterday, they were like, actually, this thing is doing much better than we thought. It's up. It's probably going to grow 1% this year. Um, so this has happened, actually, in a few other countries where uh, they've hiked rates really aggressively, have taken the pause like the Fed did, and then they waited to see whether this economic data showed whether that inflation and the economy were slowing down. It didn't, and they kept hiking uh, rates again. That happened in Australia and Canada, and it very well could happen here, but we're just going to have to wait until more economic data comes out because Powell was saying like, look, we don't, we actually have no idea what's going to happen. Inflation could go back up again. It could come down. Um, You know, who knows what's going to happen with consumer spending in the economy. So we're just going to wait for, you know, more numbers to drop. The the next meeting is in July. And uh, yeah, everyone is just going to have to wait to see what happens. Definitely the prevailing wisdom is that they'll hike again. 
Yeah. Hopefully I'm not, uh, it, come July, I'm not waking up at 145 to discuss what the Fed is doing. No, but yeah, that's, that's, that's the broad picture of, of what's going on. Let's jump into, I mentioned at the top of the show, there, we have a new number one beer in America. And remember a few weeks back when we said that Bud Light was in danger of losing its spot as a number one beer in America? Well, it no longer has to worry about that because mm-hmm. Modelo has a race past Bud Light in the last few weeks in a major reshuffle of the beer industry. So Modelo accounted for 8.4% of U.S. retail store beer sales in the last four weeks ending in July 3rd, compared to just 7.3% for Bud Light. So Neil, this is kind of the culmination of the months long boycott Bud Light has been facing from conservatives and some of its core customers after they rolled out a partnership with transgender influencer Dylan Mulvaney all the way back in April. But it's also kind of a broader precipitous drop for Bud Light in a pretty slow and steady rise for Modelo that's accelerated in the last few months. If we just want to zoom out a little bit, Modelo has seen double-digit growth in 35 of the last 40 years, while Bud Light's market share has steadily declined from 19% in 2010 to 10% in the days leading up to this partnership. So, Neil, yeah, the writing's been on the wall for a little bit, but new number one beer in America. It reminded me of those COVID trends where people said this was happening over a long time, over a long period of time. It was inevitable, but, you know, the COVID or whatever, there's something dramatic happened and it accelerated the timeline over a few years. And that feels like what happened, what happened with Modelo and Bud Light. I mean, this thing is really significant for Bud Light. I mean, sales have dropped 24 percent in the early in early June uh, from the year earlier. Earlier, so it like this has been a precipitous drop, but I do want to talk about Modelo because this rise has been absolutely incredible. I have a quick timeline here. So in 2013, 10 years ago, Modelo wasn't even in the top 10 U.S. beer brands. Uh, it didn't even launch any ling- English language ads until 2015. And then in 2018, it overtook Corona in U.S. sales, which is kind of its beer buddy. They're under the same Constellation Brands umbrella. And then in 2020, its sales were almost equivalent to the next two next best-selling imported beers, Corona Extra and Heineken. And then this May, it became the number one best-selling beer brand. So everyone in the beer industry is looking at Modelo for their playbook on how they sort of like dom- came to dominate out of absolutely right. nowhere. Their brand awareness is low. Like, do you ever think about Modelo? I, do you, are I you a Modelo have- guy? Yeah, actually a little oh, bit really? because I it was actually, yeah, my girlfriend's parents drink it. And so then I started drinking it. It's that perfect beer when you don't know what beer you want to to drink. You're like, oh, I'll do something a little fancier than just like a normal right. beer. And you do a Modelo. Yeah, it is. that. Messing- I also think that. Go ahead. Yeah. Anheuser-Busch, though, I just want to uh, take a step back because AB InBev, which is the parent company of basically every beer that you've ever drinking, drank, including uh, Bud Light and Modelo, except for in the US. Mm -hmm. So it was really funny that back uh, in, and you mentioned almost a decade ago in 2013, Anheuser-Busch bought the rights to the Modelo Brewery Group, but they, because of antitrust fears, uh, US regulators made it so they couldn't distribute Modelo and Corona in the US. So they have the worldwide distribution rights to Modelo everywhere except for where it just became the number one beer in America. And I bet at the time, they're just like, ah, it doesn't really matter. Modelo is a a smaller beer. Uh, It's never going to be that big in the US. But now it's literally (laughs) overtaken Bud Light. So it's kind of a a crazy rise from Modelo. And you know that and Hauser Bush is kicking themselves a little bit. It's funny be- that you mentioned that your girlfriend's parents uh, drink a lot of Modelo because they're on the West Coast, right? And apparently right. Modelo dominates the West Coast. And that's why I think we see it less here on the East Coast. But in Los Angeles, you know, it it, it is absolutely mm-hmm. like the beer of choice. It has been the beer of choice for many Hispanic people for a long time. And they are sort of expanding this market to the broader population. Um, but Constellation Brands portfolio of Corona, Modelo, and other Mexican beers are basically the only part of the beer uh, industry in the U.S. that is growing right now. Craft brews are out. Light brews are out. Everyone's drinking Everyone's drinking White Claw or Seltzer or High Noons. <laughs> but, but this Modelo, which is kind of is in this messy middle of not, su- like, not the IPA, 
you know, craft mm-hmm. brewer crew, not the life, not the light brew crew. Um, and it's just absolutely dominating that middle space. So hats off to them on executing an amazing marketing plan. Um, and Bud Light is not going to, to go down without a fight. Um, it is going to triple its marketing spend in the U.S. this summer and try to recapture some of those core customers that it lost over this entire fiasco. Yeah, hopefully, or we'll see if they can make inroads again. But right now, new king. I don't see Medell being dethroned anytime soon. All right, uh, let's move on to a new uh, new report um, around AI. So one of the main questions every professional is asking these days is, will AI replace my job? And, you know, with ChatGPT displaying all these capabilities and processing information and generating human-like response to it, it's kind of a reasonable question to ask. So McKinsey to the rescue, and I say that kind of ironically, (laughs) but uh, the consulting firm became one of the first to release a report that aims to quantify, put in numbers, just exactly how generative AI revolution will impact the workforce. I've got some takeaways from this report. The headline uh, is that it expects productivity gains from AI to be massive. When you can have AI do things like reply to customers or write code that would have taken you a lot longer to hammer out, it will generate a lot of economic value. And the firm predicts that generative AI will add $4.4 trillion to the economy, equivalent to 4.4% of the world's total output. But will those productivity gains mean that AI will take our jobs? Uh, And that is the big question. And McKinsey says, uh, maybe. Uh, It predicts that 60 to 70 percent of all work hours can be automated between 2030 and 2060. So that means in the future, your job could very well be different than what it is now, or it could be replaced altogether. And that brings me to the final point of the report, which I find the most interesting, actually. And that is knowledge workers, the white collar folks with masters and PhDs who we consider the professional class, they are more vulnerable to generative AI automation than other forms of technological progress in the past. The reason that the reason this is fascinating, because if you think about past years of automation, it was going after physical workers, people on assembly lines um, and not accountants, lawyers and managers like they thought they were protected. And all of a sudden, ChatGPT Bard comes along. And now people who are sitting in offices hammering out emails all day are like, "Mm, maybe AI is coming for me now. (laughs) First of all, I just think it's hilarious that McKinsey has kind of cornered the market at putting assigning numbers to these broad trends that a lot of people are talking about. I mean, remember the infamous kind of metaverse report where they said that the metaverse opportunity is too big to ignore and that it's going to generate, it's a $5 trillion opportunity by 2030. And so again, you have to always take these big picture, broad stroke uh, reports with a grain of salt a little bit. But yeah, this definitely is creating it's kind of targeting that angst that a lot of people are feeling around AI that is it coming for my job? And yeah, if you look at some of the the occupations that this report called out, just customer relations, marketing and sales, software engineering, it makes a lot of sense that AI could at least augment, maybe not replace these jobs. So this one I think does have more merit than than the metaverse one because that one was just... It felt like very pure buzzwordy. Uh, This one feels a little bit more on the nose. Right. I think about the term creative destruction, and that is this economic concept that technology kind of obliterates some professions through automation, but on net increases the number of jobs and adds value overall to the economy. Who knows whether this is going to happen with AI, but you're already seeing companies advertise AI roles. So JP Morgan has more than 3,600 AI related roles advertising, advertised from February through April. So it's already hiring people saying, hey, can you work with AI? And on the other side of the coin, IBM is higher, is slowing hiring and suspending it altogether for 26,000 back, back office roles. And the CEO said he could easily see 30% of those roles getting replaced by AI over a five-year period. So in those two data points, you can kind of see both sides of the coin. Um, so we'll see if McKinsey's right. There's no way like the, this number is going to be spot on. So I'm just right. wondering whether these these forecasts have any value whatsoever or it's just McKinsey trying to get into the news cycle. I think they're, yeah. I think they're, you could make a case for it as, you know, sort of generating a conversation. Um, I think, yeah. I think this is like the AI, you know, chat GBT, what it's going to take over is not necessarily like so theoretical as the metaverse. So, mm-hmm. you know, it generates a conversation that we're having, gets people thinking. So I think yeah. every, no one's direction. 
as long as it's directionally correct, then they can look back and say, we did our jobs right. And it, yeah, it gives CEOs guidance on how to kind of structure their workforce going forward. So yeah, again, great business model, McKinsey. Good on you. <laughs> All right, Neil, let's move on to something that won't be replaced by AI anytime soon. And that is the game of golf. The US Open kicks off today. And I know that you and I are both super excited. I'll do my best from holding back on describing why I think it's a Brooks Kepka week this week uh, to talk about the business storyline swirling around the event. So first and foremost, the thing that is on everyone's mind outside of golf is the impending merger between PGA and Live Golf, which is the Saudi-funded breakaway tour that shelled out big bucks to bring over some of the world's big name players. Cash that a lot of people felt came with the baggage of Saudi Arabia's pretty abysmal human rights record. So the merger that was announced two weeks ago caught a lot of people off guard, and we still don't have a ton of details about it. But one thing we do know is that the deal is getting a lot of heat from an antitrust perspective in the U.S. So yesterday, Democratic Senators Elizabeth Warren and Ron Wyden sent a letter to the DOJ asking them to, and I quote, closely scrutinize the merger, saying it appears to have a substantial adverse of impact on competition and would result in a monopoly of golf operations in the U.S. So they really just called it out. And also Senator Blumenthal earlier this week on Monday opened a probe into the deal as well. So Neil, as soon as this deal broke, we both kind of turned to each other and said, this feels a lot like a monopoly, right? And the word monopoly started getting thrown around a little bit. So do you think this merger or joint operation or whatever you want to call it has monopoly vibes? Oh, it definitely has monopoly vibes, which is why both sides are saying this is not a merger. It's just an investment by the Saudis into the PGA Tour. It's just a partnership. Don't call this a merger. But expert antitrust experts, uh, professors and academics are saying like, this is very textbook. Two big <laughs> players come together. Basically, the, you have the establishment monopoly, which is the PGA Tour already, has faces an upstart challenger, which was Liv. And they both talk to each other and they're like, well, competition isn't good for any of us. Why don't we get together and then split the profits? You know, that sounds great, but that is also illegal under antitrust law, the Sherman Act, which was passed in the 19th century. So um, they're going to build this as not a merger and more of a partnership. But that is mm -hmm. kind of what just happened with JetBlue and American Airlines. And the government is suing to block that partnership from happening. So the government is like, we don't care whether it's, you call it a merger or a partnership. If you are reducing competition and you are behaving like a monopoly, then we're gonna come yeah. after you. So I, yeah. no one knows what's gonna happen here because the details are so minimal, but it definitely feels like there is you know, broad support to <laughs> hate on the PGA Tour in any yeah. way possible. All right, Neil, before we jump to break, just give me your prediction. Who's gonna win this week? I was gonna say Brooks. I mean, I think Fine. he's on fire. I'll say, I'll say Scotty Scheffler. You can take Brooks. Okay. All right. Let's head into our Thursday segment, which is Neil's numbers, where uh, I read a bunch of news stories over the course of the week, and I extract the, the best numbers, the most compelling stats that I want to bring to Toby and our audience. I've got two today, um, and they're both pretty meaty. So I want to start with the first one. And for the first one, we are headed to the streets of Chicago, where there's never been a better time to own parking meters. Chicago Parking Meters LLC brought in a record $140 million in revenue last year from drivers feeding its meters. Its profits are only going to balloon more. Here is why. 15 years ago, this company paid Chicago $1.15 billion for a 75-year lease for the city's parking meters. And that's looking like the deal of the century because 15 years in, it's already recouped its initial 1.15 billion investment and more than 500 million in revenue on top of that. And it has 60 years left to go on this lease. Meanwhile, on the other side, Chicago officials are fuming because of how bad of a deal this was for the city and they can't do anything about it. So this dates back to the 2000s when the mayor auctioned off a bunch of city assets like parking meters and garages in a desperate effort to raise cash quickly. It's known around City Hall as the Great Chicago Sell-Off. At this point, it's become clear that Chicago got hosed. These private companies are jacking up prices at garages and parking meters. They're making hundreds of millions of dollars each year and taxpayers are seeing none of the revenue for the assets that the city once owned. 
That's you, crazy. Neil, we we have to go find a small city and buy up their parking meters because it seems like an incredible investment. I it, mean, not as big as Chicago, but uh, maybe like an Asheville or something. We can an find Asheville. an up-and-comer. This is a tale yeah, as old as time it. where a company does a fire – or where a city or a public you know, government does yeah. uh, a fire sale of assets when it's privatizing things. And if you are kind of like the Soviet Union, you know, if, if you are in a businessman in a <laughs> – you know, a good position to scoop up these assets at a very low price, you are going to make a zillions of dollars. And this is the insult to injury part. The city is required to reimburse the parking meter company for every parking space that's removed when streets are closed for special events, construction projects, restaurants. So it has to pay this fee to the private company that it once that it sold all of these things to. And oh, it's gross. and over the past 12 years, it's paid out uh, almost 80 million for these particular payments. So honestly, this is just, you know, a, definitely a warning sign for every government to, to not sort of take these desperate measures and sell off these public assets because it can really come to bite you. And it's bad for consumers mm -hmm. because in some cases, because they raise prices. All right, let's move on to my next number. Uh, we've got a new world record for the fastest time to solve a three by three by three Rubik's cube. Uh, on Monday, Max Park, took a Rubik's Cube from a Jackson Pollock to a Michelangelo in just 3.13 seconds, beating the record of 3.47 seconds that stood for four and a half years. Not sure how many of you are in with the cubing community, but Max is a bit of a legend. He's the world record holder, not only in the 3x3x3, but the 4x4x4 and so on, all the way up to 7x7x7, which he solved in one minute and 35 seconds. Uh, he's become an inspiration to many because he's been diagnosed with autism and at one point couldn't even open a water bottle, his parents said. Cubing served as therap therapy for Max, and now he's just the biggest deal in the cubing world. He serves as an official ambassador and he started a Netflix documentary about cubing. Uh, this video is that. amazing. Yo, you Electric. watched it? Yeah, great documentary. I highly recommend. So you're a cuber. How, yeah. how impressive is three seconds? So my big deal was getting solving a Rubik's Cube under one minute. And it just feels so incredibly inadequate at this point because I have to do it. I have to go through the same algorithms every time and do the same movements. They can look at a cube and know all the shortcuts to take. I never got to the point where I recognize patterns enough to, to take shortcuts. But yeah, watching it, it's truly unfathomable how quickly it just goes from nothing to solve and yeah. i love this video if, if you have a chance go look at it online because the entire place just erupts and like yeah people love max like he is definitely a legend um and yeah it's just one of the more electric things he has a hand towel that he wipes his hands off before he does the cubing so it's just it's a sport i think it's truly an incredible display of athleticism and brain power did you also know that rubik's cube is perhaps the best-selling toy of all time it's sold 450 million units since it was first introduced in 1974 i'm ready for the rubik's cube movie uh in addition to the tetris one <laughs> All right, let's yeah. close off the show with a trip to Sweden where inflation came in hotter than expected last month. It was supposed to rise by 7.8%, but instead it rose by 8.2%. Economists were a little perplexed. Why did their forecast miss so much? And then it hit them. Beyonce. Beyonce began her Renaissance tour in May with two shows in Stockholm, and those concerts were single-handedly responsible for driving inflation more than expected last month. Over her two nights of shows, Beyonce drew more than 80,000 people to the Friends Arena in Stockholm, and the sheer demand on hotels and restaurants in the area allowed those owners to jack up prices, causing so much inflation that it showed up in the government's data. So the upshot here is that one person, by the sheer force of her popularity, Boosted inflation for an entire country. That is not normal. Uh, Donska Bank's chief economist, who kind of recognized that Beyonce was behind this, said it's quite astonishing for a single event. We have not seen this before. I can't believe they called her out like this. They literally said Beyonce is responsible for the extra upside surprise this month called her out by name. I do want to just shout out our girl Taylor Swift though, because she's having a similar effect on local economies. Uh, reports showing that she's generating $4.6 billion for local economies through her eras to her. And then also she absolutely crushed it in Chicago specifically, where they had their highest hotel occupancy rate ever. 96.8% of hotels were booked. So I do, we're going to look back in 10 years on this era of the heiress tour and the Beyonce tour and say two women 
absolutely powered the global economy and maybe powered inflation to higher levels. So <laughs> just absolute tour day forces, both of them. So pretty funny to hear these stats. You know that Jerome Powell is looking at the Renaissance tour dates and seeing that Beyonce is coming to Philly for her first U.S. date on July 12th. And he's probably like, oh, my God. So Shaking his head. We, yeah. we talked earlier that uh, they were penciling in rate hikes for the rest for, for the rest of the year. And I think we can probably put those uh, in pen at this point. Uh, Toby, <laughs> we did it. We did our first remote pod. I, I pray that you go back to bed. Um, you're, you're an absolute champ for getting up and doing this with me. You did great. Um, listeners, if you want to write us in, uh, you can. at uh, Our email address is morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com. One, uh, one listener wrote in yesterday and bashed my take on Ed Sheeran as a lazy songwriter. <laughs> I think she actually changed my mind about it. So let me know what else we are wrong about. And obviously, we have to give a huge shout out to our crew who always gets up early with us to help make this show. Incredible people. Uh, Emily Milliron is our editor and producer. Uber Batista, what's up, Uber? And Raymond Liu are the associate producers. Yuchenna Waogu is our technical director. Billy Menino is on audio. Hair and Makeup is in Chicago paying off a parking ticket. Devin Emery is our chief content officer. And our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>